Hi, welcome to Cultural Connections. I'm Nancy Commandoris, the Cultural Arts Supervisor for the City of Farmington Hills. I thought our audience might be interested in meeting one of our teachers from our summer camps and some of our other programs in the City of Farmington Hills because we're always telling you what wonderful artists we have teaching our classes. Um, and we're here with Rachel Reynolds in her studio that she shares with Robert Zahorsky. It's a wonderful place, Rachel, and I'm so happy to be down here in Hamtramck with you to be able to see where you work. Yay! So, yeah. I'm so glad you guys came down. <laughs> yeah, thanks Thanks for joining us and, and letting us come here today. Absolutely. And it's vast. You've got so much space to work in, and you've got so many different things going on, and we're going to talk about some of the work that you have here. But first of all, I want to ask you about the summer camps, and I know you've been teaching with us for a number of years, mm -hmm. and uh, you do the summer camps for for different age groups, mm -hmm. right? Do you want to talk a little bit about what you do for us for the City of Farmington Hills? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I love making work, making my own art, but I also love being and working as an educator, and I teach at a variety of places. So uh, during the school year, I'm teaching college students and senior citizens, and I love in the summer taking a break from that and working with the kids. And you guys have great programming, some of the best around. Oh. So I love when you give me a template like the multicultural camp. Mm -hmm. right. And then I get to research different countries and think of what kind of art um, is pertinent to each country that I can translate into a project for the students to the exposure of different cultures and then get to have fun making art. So we've done all kinds of countries from a bunch of them in, Euro in Europe mm -hmm. and Asia and all over, even uh, Native Americans. Um, we have, uh, I'm in Hamtramck, so I think we did a Polish one one year. Um, and I have them do different things off my mind. I remember Ital there was an Italian one, and so I talked to him about Michelangelo and mm -hmm. how he had to paint um, in the Sistine Chapel, like upside down, looking up. So I had the students, uh, we taped paper to the bottom of the tables, and they all brought in pillows. <laughs> And they laid on the floor on the, underneath the tables on their pillows, and they had to do their drawings and paintings upside down to give them that experience. Sure. Um, so that's one that comes off the top of my head. Then there's another camp that I get to do with them that's the contemporary artist, yeah, artist that 20th was, century artist. That was very cool this summer. And so I've done that a couple times, and mm -hmm. we have a good time. This summer we did about a dozen artists in a span of five days. So we did two or three a day each day. And one of them, Bryce Martin, he collects sticks, he paints with sticks, so we went out into the park and the children had a good time picking out different shapes and sized sticks and then they come in and we added a little water to the paint to make it liquidy and they would paint with <laughs> sticks and make all kinds of marks and let the paint run. And um, Jackson Pollock, you know, oh, they yeah. love that sure. one. We well, go sure outside, <laughs> we go outside and we don't do that in the stables, but we lay all the papers on the floor, big huge ones, I want them to work large. So big huge poster boards and they get to splat the paint. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we did uh, one on Christo and Jean Claude. Everyone yes. got the colored uh, party paper, that you <laughs> party streamer paper. We went down into the park and they picked different signs and benches and fences mm -hmm. and they wrapped them in color and then mm -hmm. we photographed them so they had documentation. We should kind of explain what he did. Yes, what sorry. He, yeah, what, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Well, that he would wrap things like bridges and just huge things on mm -hmm. the landscape with just completely covered, an uh, entire bridge, whatever, you yep. know. So that's what the kids were doing, were wrapping up, uh, you know, yes. park benches and things like that. And they gave him that personal connection to the artist they'll always remember. Yeah, so thank you, Nancy. Yeah, before I, before we dig into the projects, I show them pictures of the artist so they know what they look mm -hmm. like, lots of pictures of their works, and we talk about what they do, and then, then we move yeah. into the project. There was um, Yoi Kusama, that was a couple years ago, and she polka dots things. Mm -hmm. She's been a working artist since the 60s, but she's still really relevant today. I think she's going to have a retrospect of her work in New York starting January. Yeah. And so she polka dots um, everyday objects, and then she puts them together and makes installations. And so I went to the dollar store and I got all these different plastic uh, flip-flops and brooms and waste baskets oh, yeah. and cups and saucers and the students loved normally they paint on paper so they were like we get to paint on an object we get to paint on a shoe mm -hmm. so they painted it white and then they painted it after that dried a solid color and then they polka dotted so they did a different step every day and at the end of the week everyone had their own object but they each had turns assembling them all on a table mm -hmm. to make a display kind of like a window display and emulate what she did so yeah we get outside the box we don't just uh -huh always work 
small in, in drawing and painting. And I just love that because so many times you think of children in art classes, they're going to be sitting there, they're going to be painting or drawing in the same mm -hmm. type of thing, and you just, like you say, out of the box. You yes. make them think in a different way, just as these artists did, and I think they'll understand contemporary art much better because of that. Yes, and I want to expose them because I'm hoping when they're small, if they <laughs> appreciate art, then they'll grow into adults that sure. will appreciate and support the arts. And sure. That's what we need. Well, I think it's so great that the kids can grasp um, those concepts so much easier than adults can sometimes. And you can see that in what you do. I think it's, it's just fascinating to me. Um, it's, it, can you talk about the Art Adventure Camp? Yes, a little bit too, I was just going to get to that one. Yeah, I love that. We, we love working on that one. And then I get to work with other art, um, different other art artists. We have mm -hmm. musicians, we have photographers, um, storytelling and performance. Mm -hmm. So I love getting to work with other types of artists, not just the visual artists. Mm -hmm. And the students get to rotate from teacher to teacher. So they go to four stations a day, so they get a little taste of all of it. And when they come to me, we have a wonderful, the stable studio is mm -hmm. wonderful studio for them to come in. And that's more of a mixed media camp. So I have make sure that they get their hands wet and they get to do a little bit of sculpture in clay and they get to do a little bit of painting. Um, they get to do some drawing, they get to do some collage. So I like to add a lot of different textures and textiles um, for them to get a uh, full experimentation when they come through that. And, uh, and again, like you said, there's an uh, age group from four to seven, and mm -hmm. then an older group, eight to nine? Eight, uh, to, eight, to, 11. 11. Uh -huh. eight to 11. Eight to 11. And so we try to tweak the projects so mm -hmm. they're uh, suitable for the different skill levels and yeah. focus levels of each age group. But the kids have a blast, and it's so fun to watch. From the beginning of camp, they're timid and kind of shy and they don't know anyone to the end, you know, halfway through the week they have best friends at camp oh, and yeah. hugging each other and, you know, s just making great friends and I enjoy, actually this couple weeks ago I went to a uh, art fair in Ferndale mm -hmm. and I ran into some of the students I had this summer and they ran up to me, you're my oh, art teacher, you're my art teacher, so it's great to see them beyond the camps as well. We should mention that all these classes take place at Heritage Park in the Stable Studio, which is historical building that was uh, part of it was gutted and made into a studio classroom and it's right in the park so that's mm -hmm. what's great about it is the kids can get outside and get out on the trails and take uh, photographs and make music in different buildings and so on and it's just a great summer oh, adventure it really is an art adventure for is. them and they love it because they get to change around like that it's just mm -hmm. so cool and you're bridging learning and being mm -hmm. exposed to new materials and ideas and concepts with having fun mm -hmm. So, and, ha and enjoying the process. Because I have taught at places where it's very rigid, and yes, they're learning, but they're, they're, not, they're not having so much fun. Yeah. And everyone's having fun at Art Adventure Camp. And they always want to come back, and that's yes. great. And every yes. year it changes. So yes. that's, that's great, too. Yeah, we're always rotating the project so <laughs> that the kids that I see from year to year are doing new things each time. Absolutely. Now, do you teach adults as well? Yes. Um, I've... I'm 33 and a half. I think I've <laughs> been teaching since I was uh, at least 25. Um, I teach currently at Oakland University. I love it there. I have fabulous students and colleagues. Um, it's a great program. I teach drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. I also teach at the Flint Institute of Arts, and they also have a wonderful program mm -hmm. and facilities. And it is an hour from Detroit, but I love it. It's worth the drive, mm -hmm. and I have family up in Flint, so I always get to visit them when I'm done. Um, I teach at CCS in continuing education. Mm -hmm. uh, in Gross Point, I run a class uh -huh. that I teach. It's all women. It's a painting class. It meets once a week from September through May. So that's a great group of, you know, we get, it's intimate since we meet each other once a week. Sure. And those ladies, I set up a still life every week, so if they want to paint from life, they can. A lot of them come with their own ideas and they want to experiment or they have photographs or other images that they want to make work off of. and. So I just cater to each individual need, which I do in most of my classes, sure. um, but particularly in that one. And then I also teach for the Farmington Hills Cultural Division mm -hmm. and in Detroit Public Schools through art-infused education. And that's wow. a really interesting program because we meet with the, I'm not teaching art, I'm using art to teach other concepts. So I meet with the homeroom teacher, mm -hmm. Um, I worked with third graders and I followed them into fourth and fifth grade for three years. I worked with the same group. And so I meet with the homeroom teacher, find out where do they need to strengthen their skills. Perhaps it's in reading and vo 
vocabulary and comprehension, perhaps it's math. Really? So whatever the skills they need to strengthen, then I try to design projects using what I know about art and um, use them as a tool for the students to gain skills and strengthen skills in whatever particular subject oh. they need to. That's interesting. Can you give us an example of a um, project? I worked with a, I assisted for a couple years so I could kind of learn as I, as I went. And I worked with a wonderful, um, she was a modern dancer and we had, with her, we had to strengthen the reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. And so, and vocabulary. So she would pick, um, she'd go through the vocabulary words and help the students to think about dance and movement, think about tempo. Are they high, are they low, are they medium with their bodies? Um, are they moving fast or quick? And they would create body movements that would kind of represent or symbolize some of the meanings mm -hmm. of the words. And then later it helps them associate and remember oh, better. Okay. Um, a different time I was working with some people from the Matrix Theater um, in Southwest Detroit. Mm -hmm. And the students were reading a play, but they were in third grade, so they still needed to learn about what is a plot, what is a character, what is a setting, you know, those mm -hmm. types of definitions. And so we created um, kind of a visual map of the play. So the students made characters that were kind of like puppets, and then they got to research. Um, I think it was a Native American story was the play. So they got to research characteristics of different Native Americans and what kinds of clothes they would wear. And they made these um, puppets. They weren't puppets like this, but they were, mm -hmm. you know, two-dimensional puppets, collaged, basically, that they made. Um, for the setting, there was a, an ocean and, and boats. And so we had, I got this big, beautiful, iridescent sheet of fabric. It was, I think it was a tablecloth. But it was iridescent blue, and we laid it on the ground. And they, some students made the setting, so they drew the boats and cut them out. Um, and other people did the characters. And basically, then when we said the play out loud, when they read it out loud, whatever they were saying, they would be moving their character oh. into the basically mm -hmm. foreground or setting um, that we had created. So that helped them understand the different parts that created a play mm -hmm. and the specificity of a setting versus a character and understand how the plot occurs by actually integrating and moving all the parts of the play. That's a, a real physical connection yeah. as opposed to just reading it. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can so see those are would. off the top of my head some yeah. of the things well, we this, did. I can see how that would really stick with them and they'd really get so much more out of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. that's so, so, so I'm all over the place yeah. teaching. Um, like I said, I love, I, I love working in my studio. I can be in here late at night with Rob. He'll be at his end working. I'll be at my end. We'll be rocking out. The music will be loud. I'll be in my zone. But he could be here days on end and be a hermit and never mm -hmm. leave or talk to anyone. I'm very social. So I love being able to work with all these different types sure. of age groups and skill levels and share what I love and um, meet new people all the time. So it's a good balance for well, me. Your enthusiasm really <laughs> Aids to the aids the teaching. You know, I think everybody just connects with you so easily. All the different age groups, Rachel, because yeah. you just love it so much. It shows. Well, and, and if you're you know. passionate about something, you know, this is <laughs> teaching. I think is one of the. I've had lots of jobs. I did mm -hmm. screen printing. I worked in galleries, commercial galleries. I worked um, doing conservation and restoration. Um, so I've had lots of art-related jobs, but this is the one where I'm not looking at my watch. When do I got to go home? Uh -huh. You know, it's just. I'm loving every minute of it, and when it's done, it's done, it's and great. you know, so I can't complain. <laughs> we were we were certainly luck lucky to find you for Farmington Hills, that's for sure. Well, because it's, it's a match. Yeah, and the programs have all been so successful, and the kids just they still talk about the summer camp. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great experience for them. Well, they're lucky. They're lucky. You guys do great work. You oh, and Rachel okay. Pimlin have great programming. Well, thanks. So Rachel, um, if someone wanted to have a studio tour. Uh, down in Hamtramck here at your studio, how would they get a hold of you? Well, they contact me through email. My email is looksewonder, all one okay. word, L-O-O-K-S-E-E-W-O-N-D-E-R at okay. yahoo.com. Okay. And Robert does metal, stone, and glass, and I do the painting and drawing, and we love to have people come through and check out our work and have, mm -hmm. you know, conversations about it. And you, so. do, you do gallery tours as yes. part of Hamtramck's gallery tour, Actually, right? in uh, uh, two weeks, they're having a... Uh, studio crawl in Hamtramck, mm -hmm. and there's about a dozen uh, artists that are participating Great. in that. So That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. We try to clean the place up a bit. Usually, when we're working, <laughs> it's a big mess. So we try we try to clean it up, pull out some of the work, 
show it to people when they come through, well, have some drinks. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. It's a creative process. You're supposed to make a mess. That's, yeah. That's all oh, part yeah. of it. Yeah. Well, that's great. And what have you got coming up in the future? Well, thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, there's the next project that I'm working on. I'm really excited about it. And it, these days, people don't really know their neighbors mm -hmm. so much. Um, not like they used to. And so, and I just moved, I've been in Hamtramck for four years, but I just moved in November to a new street. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any of my neighbors. So in an effort to get to know them, I wanted to, and this gets back to the site-specific mm -hmm. kind of mirroring something and where it's um, living and where it's hung. I wanted to ask the people in my street individually to pick an item in their home that they really treasure. Um, usually it has something to do with association or memory, so not necessarily valuable financially or monetarily, but just something that they really value because of their life experience. And I wanted to do, do still life paintings of those objects that are special to them and then mm -hmm. give them as a gift oh. back to them. Um, mm -hmm. My only catch is that I want to hang the painting in proximity to the objects that are painted in the painting. So again, there's that play between oh. the real and the illusion of the real. Mm -hmm. But also the painting is celebrating those objects. Um, and this came from a few places, um, partly because in Hamtramck, there's such diversity. Uh, on my street, there's people that are um, from Yemen, from Bangladesh, from Bosnia, um, Pakistan. Obviously, there's Polish community, Lithuanians, mm -hmm. Ukrainians. And so it's very diverse. And I think um, kind of focusing on objects in people's lives that they treasure will point out the differences in the cultures and what they treasure, mm -hmm. but also the similarities and how mm -hmm. people can be from a lot of different places and all still care about the same things. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives me a chance to kind of explore in someone else's house and meet people <laughs> I don't know. Um, so you have to be careful, obviously, sure. when you're hanging sure. out with strangers, but, but that's how you, everyone's a stranger before you meet them. So mm -hmm. that's how you build communities, by meeting the people that you live around. Um, also, as a teacher, I set up still lives for a lot of my beginning painting students. And they're just kind of a bunch of stuff, and I set them up there mostly so that my students and I can have the same thing to look at and talk mm -hmm. about value and color. Um, but they're more or less content-wise kind of meaningless. Um, I set up things that are reflective so they have that challenge, and things that are glass so they have that challenge, um, and get those skills under their belt. But the items, per se, don't have a lot of meaning or content. And so I was but I'm constantly having them paint these still lives. So I wanted to, th and I don't paint mm -hmm. still lives mm -hmm. particularly anymore in my work. So I had a little tension between I'm having them paint still lives, but I don't. So I wanted to find a way to come up with painting a still life that does have meaning and content. Yes. And is interesting to me. Interesting to you, yeah. And I'm very sure. social. And this is a way, again, where I get to, through this project, I get to meet a bunch of people and learn personal things about them mm -hmm. and hopefully make some friends. So. That's the Perfect. next project I'm, you know, ready to embark on. That's it's been mulling around in my mind for a good year now. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. Usually you have an idea and then you got to distill it, distill it, distill it. So I think I'm, I think I'm ready to start knocking on some doors in my neighborhood. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, I like the combination of being social and, and painting and getting all of that out of it. Mm -hmm. and maybe some of those neighbors will start talking to each other too about what you're doing. Yes, and so they, that could yeah. be another effect. That's a great thing to yeah. because I'd really love to exhibit the work. There's a gallery in Hamtramck called the Edwin Gallery. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. space right in downtown off mm -hmm. Joseph Campo. And I'd really like to, uh, I envision having the work ex displayed there just for that reason, so that people that all participated can um, have access mm -hmm. to go see the work and also meet the other people that participated and just, yeah, get a dialogue yeah. going. And in my mind, <clears throat> the way I would exhibit the work is I'd, I, since I'm giving them the gift of the painting, I don't want to take it back. So uh -huh. I'd probably make a jacle, you know, a, a, a printed mm -hmm. copy of mm -hmm. the actual painting to display in the gallery. And then I'd like on either side of that to have a panel of um, a photograph of the painting installed in their house next to the object. So you see that relationship between the illusion and the real. Um, then the jacle, and then on the other side of that, have a, a written statement describing why those objects are important oh. or treasured to the person. So that uh -huh. gives the viewer a little more intimate information sure. to connect with what they're looking at. So each participant would kind of have three panels. Oh. 
to tell a story. Oh, I love it. Yeah. yeah I can't yeah. wait to see that. Me neither. Yeah. Maybe yeah. then I'll make a book. I think it'd yeah. be a nice format to, to put the exhibition in a book as well. And you're going to start this tomorrow, right? I'm going to so start it. <laughs> yeah, it's the next thing on my list. That's great. It is. Wonderful. <laughs> well, cool. well, yeah. Let's, let's take a walk around and look at great. some of your work, okay? Okay. Fabulous. So, Rachel, this painting is from Oakland University of an exhibit and it has an interesting history of before, after, and during. So can you mm -hmm. explain a little bit about that? Yes. So the title of the piece is um, <laughs> During, Before, and After, the view of uh, the Oakland University Art Gallery, September 2010. And it solicits viewers to determine the relationship between the illusion of space that they are seeing in the painting and their actual perceptual experience of the space they are standing in. So in essence, it is reflecting um, this painting is this painting, and these walls, this, these walls and corner where they meet the floor, is actually an illustration of the gallery in which the painting will hang. Mm -hmm. So it's mirroring the space that it's hanging in. Um, and I, it follows along with uh, some other site-specific work I've been working on for a while now <laughs> in terms of paintings that are site-specific to the places they're hanging in. I also, it's a faculty show, Oakland University Art mm -hmm. Faculty Show, and so I wanted to incorporate some of the work of my colleagues into my work. So this is Corey Beldoff. Um, I, ha I was lucky to have her to work with. She does beautiful ink drawings, um, and these pieces actually talk about time as well, her, oh. her ink drawings, if you ever Google her name. Um, so our work had that in common. They both were talking about time. So she and I had to stage it. We mm -hmm. went into the gallery in July and she hung her pieces um, and I hung my blank canvas on the wall so that I could get all the proportions correct and take a photo and use the photo as source material for the painting. So when I was painting it in July and August, I felt like I was painting what would be in October. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I was painting the future um, before it was happening. Mm -hmm. And certainly when it's hanging during the gallery space, it's um, showing the present. And after the work comes down, um, I left this blank so it talks about its temporality and kind of talks about how when the whole painting and exhibition comes down, that's what the gallery will look like again. It'll be blank <laughs> wall. So the piece is asking its audience to kind of really look at the space around them and kind mm -hmm. of see and explore it with their own eyes and then the differences between the actual space and the illusion of space. <laughs> I'm thinking too about the time element, like how did they do this? Yes. Because the exhibit, this exhibit is up right now, so how did they do this? So exactly. That's kind of yeah, a fun. lot of, yeah. you're, you're right, a lot of people, they they <laughs> enjoy it, but they're like, how, like a photograph, yeah. you know, can be instantaneous, but a painting right. obviously takes a long time. So yeah. how could she have painted this, pro, you know, before it's happening? So. Fun. Yes, it was a lot of work, but I, I had a blast. Yeah, but it's great. And, 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 really and I've been holding this the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. I had, after we did install the work, um, Corey stood about where you are and was mm -hmm. looking at my piece, and I stood looking at her work, and we photo, you know, I set up the tripod to photograph it, so that really the, this is, this is not the finished piece until it's installed into the gallery, uh -huh. and, and, you know, really has the gallery to work with it. The gallery is part of the piece, too. Mm -hmm. So this postcard kind of helps tell that story a little bit better. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well let's look at a few more things. Great. Rachel, this is really an interesting project. You explained it a little bit earlier mm -hmm. and I explained it to our viewers because I think it's fascinating. I'd love to. So I, um, this project is, I did about a series of eight paintings that are similar, you know, in this fashion, in this formula. And I have a truck. I love my truck. I drive all my big paintings around in my truck. But um, I wanted, again, to find ways to get out of the studio. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in here. I want to engage with the real world, meet new people, um, engage in the world, and use it as source material to bring back to the studio and, and work with. So I made a list of things that I like to do um, in my free time. And one of them is explore and mm -hmm. drive around and talk to strangers and these types of things. And so I ended up. Um, also wanting to engage more with my community and a lot of my neighbors rely on public transportation um, so I thought well I rarely ride the bus but I'm gonna sit put myself in that situation and <laughs> engage with people in my community and kind of you know put those shoes on and see what it's like to ride the bus on a daily basis so I really wasn't riding to get from A to B I was riding to be on the bus a long time so I could draw and mm -hmm. record and get source material for my work 
I rode the bus about four to five hours a day, three to five days a week. Wow. For about six months. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> At that time, I lived in Midtown near Wayne State. And I took about four different lines um, regularly at that time. And anyway, so I, I did lots of, prod lots of different ways of uh, recording information. But finally, I decided I'm overwhelmed with all the stimulation. So I need to narrow it down. And I'm only going to draw through the lens of color. So on Monday, I'll just draw things that are red and only red. And that way, I can focus and not be inspired by everything around mm -hmm. me. And so um, this is an example of like a little, I would just have uh, colored pencils on my lap um, and this kind of plastic paper and I would plot where things were in relation proportionally to me on the bus. So if they were at the front of the bus, they'd be at the top of the page. If they were you know, in the middle of the bus, they'd be in the middle of the page. And then I would just draw what I saw. So if you had a red shirt on and I didn't see your whole shirt, I just saw a part of your shoulder because my view is obstructed by someone else or a seat, mm -hmm. then it just became a fragmented shape. So these um, seemingly look abstract, but they're not invented. They're all based on real life observations. And so I just do red things. And then the next day, I'd say, well, I'm only going to draw things that I see that are blue. Um, sometimes patterns would come up, like uh, a nursing staff would get off, and then there'd be all these mm -hmm. yeah. blue scrubs, blue scrubs, blue scrubs, you know, that I'd be drawing. Um, the next day, yellow. The next day, green. And at the end of the week, I took all my small pieces of paper that I did the pencil drawings on. And they're um, semi-transparent, and I stacked them on top of each other. And this is kind of what they all looked like uh, together. And so I said, OK, this is like a, week, a week's Look ride on, on the bus. bus. <laughs> um, and so again, it's really fragmented. Uh, mm, it looks it. kind of abstract, but it's all based on real observation. Um, this one's called Monday Great. through Friday. Uh, this is, what is this one called? Um, merry-go-round, um, you know, I just felt like I was getting on the bus, getting off, getting on yeah. the bus, so the adult merry-go-round. Um, this one is interesting. I, I usually ask, uh, when I'm giving talks to students, ask them to try to find a common shape. If you look through this one, I was just drawing browns, tans, um, taupes, and beiges, and the same shape kept coming up again and again, and it's this kind of jagged U-shape that you see. And as it gets farther away from me, it gets smaller. Um, but I see it again and again. And do you have any guesses on what that might might be, Nancy? Well, the, the shape of, <laughs> yeah, the shape of that looks like fur to me, of course. Yeah. You know, and so I'm assuming that was winter time. It was. And, and everyone has, whether it's a dressy coat or a sporty coat, they uh -huh. got the hoods. And it's cold out. They got the hoods, and the hoods are f lined with sure. fur. And so it was that that's the shape that I was seeing again and again in the browns. Um, so it was repeated. And this one's called furs and skins. It, it's the furs are the collars in the winter. In the summer, everyone's, t you know, I usually see their necks and their hands, but sure. they're wearing tank tops and shorts. So you start to see the skin. So it talks about, um, it is playing with word play. You know, it talks sure. about uh, the time of year, the season. Um, but it also, so up at the top, there's some ladies. You see their knees and legs. You see their arms. They're holding the poles. Um, here, there's a woman leaned over reading a book. So we see her arms and just this little bit of her back between her shirt and her pants. <laughs> um, so it was, yeah, different climates. That one's kind of recording what people have on or don't in different climates. Um, and then this one is uh, secondary colors, like greens and oranges and, and purples. Um, and I started just mixing my palette and drawing these arcs that, you know, my palette, and then it goes to where I plotted it. So. There's, I wanted to point out, like here, you could recognize there's a tie. Someone has uh -huh. a necktie on. There's a, their arm is over their lap. So sure. there's Just wherever I don't see something, then um, my view is obstructed, and then the shape stops. But mm -hmm. got a Nike shoe and <laughs> a book bag, and so I think it's fun. Uh, viewers come and they, it's kind of uh, they look through the image and they, it's like a scavenger hunt. What mm -hmm. can they recognize? Mm -hmm. um, what can they identify? What can they try to read in the image? But I did a series of about um, 12 of these. So I have four here today hanging in the studio. Um, but that was a blast. Okay. I just, I loved riding the bus, and I met all kinds of people. I bet you did. Did anybody question you about what you were doing? Oh, yeah. Well, uh -huh. they, actually, the, a lot of Detroit public schools, they don't have separate school buses. So at certain mm -hmm. times of day, it's flooded with kids that are getting oh. out of school. And the kids, of course, were not shy. And they see me on my lap with all these colored pencils and papers. They come right up to me. 
and they want to know, you know, oh, what are you doing? And then what was great is if they did drawings too, they, oh, can I show you my drawings? Aww. And they'd pull out their little sketchbooks and, um, yeah, I, I made a few f adult friends on the bus as well. Uh -huh. um, usually people want to know what you're doing and then they, maybe they tell you a story about an artist that they know sure. and um, we go from there. But yeah, it was oh, that's great. great engaging, you know, again, getting out of the studio, living, living life, engaging with life, bringing that source mm -hmm. material back to work with. And see what, I mean, most people when they think of the bus, they think you know, it's like slow and it's boring and it's drab and it's dirty and you know, this, uh -huh. this, this can come out of it too. It's wonderful. <laughs> that's just, I love that. I just Thanks. love that. Yeah. Wow. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the other one over here. All right. So this one, Rachel, is a clothesline, and I know it's not complete <laughs> yet, mm -hmm. but um, explain to me how you got onto the series of Mary's. Yes, so this, this piece is entitled Dressed for a Cause, <laughs> a week's worth of laundry. So I go home, I grew up in Sterling Heights, I go home to visit my parents where I grew up every Sunday, and we mm -hmm. have a nice meal, and then my dad and I go on a walk through the neighborhood. So, um, so I've been living, or I grew up there since the early, late 70s, and um, in the past uh, 10 years, five, 10 years, there's been a large influx in Sterling Heights of Catholic Iraqis, and I mm -hmm. think, um, uh, I think evidence of that is when I go on walks with my dad, the, in front of almost every other house, there's a, a Mary statue, Virgin mm -hmm. Mary statue, and so I, whenever I'm in the world exploring, I like to look for common denominators, you know, so I thought, oh, this is, you know, evidence of the culture living within a place, um, and, but I started looking at them, so you find the common denominator, and then you start to look at, you know, how are they a little bit different, and so I have this whole other series, actually, where I'm documenting um, the actual statues in front of different people's homes and looking at how, how it's decorated and everything, but I started this series, um, I started thinking, well, if Mary were around today, um, I think she'd probably tire of wearing the blue robe every single day, you know. So I wanted to give her, uh, you know, more color in her wardrobe. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, weeks worth of laundry, I'll give her a different colored robe for every day of the week. I also was thinking about um, how if she were around, she'd probably be dressed for a cause, wearing ribbons. Um, some of the little ribbons in there. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, the, other people have, um, what do they call it? I call them front yard accessories, but um, lawn ornaments. Uh -huh. And you'll see there'll be uh, deer or, or geese, and sometimes they dress the they geese. They dress them up, yeah. You know, for uh -huh. if the hockey is winning, they'll dress them up in red wings, or if it's Halloween, they'll dress them up like a witch. So I, I kind of was playing on that idea as mm -hmm. well, like dressing her up wearing the ribbon for a cause. So I started researching all the different causes um, for the different colored ribbons. Often there'll be 10 to 15 different mm -hmm. causes associated with the ribbon. So that was fun to research, but I wanted to illustrate her, um, you know, in, a, in her environment as a statue in front of the different residences, um, but she's got a robe, she's got her different colored ribbon, and then to illustrate the idea of a week's worth of laundry, um, I thought I'd, I'd probably do a line drawing of the clothes mm -hmm. posts, and then actually pin an actual three-dimensional rope or line to the drawing, and then, she, you know, she's hanging mm -hmm hanging to dry out a week's worth of laundry, but... They're all colored pencil. Yes, correct? these are colored pencil. Very detailed, and that's the, you know, these aren't prints, these are the actual yes. drawings. They're, they're wonderful. Yes, and sometimes she's mingling, like here there's some pinwheels, and there's a little mm -hmm. rooster behind her, and sometimes she'll have a crown around her head, around her neck, sometimes there'll be rosaries, but in these I really started paying attention to the different um, types of rocks and stones and uh, obviously foliage, um, mm -hmm. but all the different, the lighting, all the different things that people, you know, just like in the bus series, yeah. and you can determine things about people based on what they're wearing, maybe, you know, their age, their, where they work, if they're, if they're a student, um, personality, obviously, mm -hmm. I think how you decorate your front yard says something yeah. also about, you know, who lives in those houses. Oh, those are great. Yeah. It's just wonderful. Yeah. How fun. It's just <laughs> fun. Everything you do, Rachel, seems to have a, an element of fun in it. I love that. Yes, that's my whimsy, Great. my silly, silliness coming out. Yeah. yeah, but I enjoy it too. And I can see why you relate so well to the kids, you know, the students <laughs> that you have, because, you know, after visiting your studio and seeing how open your mind is and how unique your thoughts are, this has just been 
wonderful. Wow. It's, been, it's been so enjoyable to be Thank here with you. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Come back. Come back soon. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I will. Obviously, things change here very often, yes. and there's a, a lot more to see. We've only touched on a few things in this vast space, but, but what a ball. And Thank you so much for having us in. Oh, my pleasure. And again, you know, we're just so lucky to have you on staff with us in Fire Region Hills. Well, I look forward to yes. working with you years to come. Good times. Yes. Well, well, thanks again, <laughs> Rachel. This is great. Thanks. We thanks, Nancy. It. Okay. And thanks to all of you for joining us today on Cultural Connections.